Good evening and welcome. Uh, this is the first virtual event of seven. Uh, this semester in our Basic Science Lights the Way series. Last fall, Francis Hellman, Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences and I partnered to launch this series. And it's been a great way to share science with a broad audience, regardless of physical location. Well, I enjoy in-person gatherings as most of us do. We've adapted and embraced Zoom as a way to stay connected. Evolution through adaption is an idea central to biology after all. This past year has been difficult, but science talk is always a morning star for a look into the future. And as an optimist, I think the future is bright. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to listen to a topic to familiar to many of us, aging and the diseases of aging. We, we shall barely scratch the surface, but our aim is to tell you about some of the great work and introduce you to the great researchers here at Cal working in the field of aging, broadly defined. We're going to hear from five fantastic scientists. Please do use the chat room to ask questions of the speakers. To give you a roadmap, we're going to hear about Parkinson's disease, a neuro neurodegenerative disease in the aged. You're going to hear about the biology of aging, and you're going to hear about cancer as a disease of the aged. Andy Dillon, an HHMI investigator and professor in our Division of Genetics, Genomics and Development in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology, will be speaking with his postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Ashley Frakes, with a focus on how scientists use model animal systems to study the aging process itself. And David Rollet, a professor in the Division of Immunology and Pathogenesis in the Molecular and Cell Biology Department, will be presenting with his graduate student, Natalie Wolf, work they've done advancing the field of cancer immunotherapy. Web pages and articles for each of the speakers will be provided to each of you in a follow-up email. So for a more in-depth look into their work of the speakers, you should go to that email. With no time to spare, I'll introduce our moderator this evening, Randy Sheckman. Randy is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and a professor of cell and developmental biology, also in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. Randy is a 2013 Nobel laureate in physiology and medicine for his work and that of his co-laureates were cited for their discoveries of the machinery regulating vesicle traffic, a major transport system in our cells. Randy leads a group at UC Berkeley devo devoted to this work, but Randy will start the conversation tonight by speaking about Parkinson's. Over to you, Randy. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to uh, welcome the panelists and to uh, briefly introduce uh, a new effort that I'm engaged in to organize an international consortium of basic scientists who are trying to uncover the molecular and cellular basis of Parkinson's disease. So let me begin by sharing uh, some slides that I have that uh, illustrate the question. Now, um, one of the necessary developments along with aging is the progression of uh, diseases. We've made tremendous uh, strides in treating cancer and heart disease but neurodegenerative diseases continue to be a scourge. Uh, among them, one of the most rapidly rising forms of neurodegenerative disease is Parkinson's disease. My interest in this began at a personal level over 20 years ago when my wife developed Parkinson's disease. She struggled with this disease for 20 years. And now just over three years ago, she died uh, of, the, of the illness. I became interested in the science around Parkinson's disease. And I wanna tell you what we know a little bit about the disease, uh, its progression, and what uh, may be a possible future effort at scientific investigation focused on the disease. Uh, the disease is a pandemic around the world. It's rising in incidence. There are 1 million people who suffer from the disease in the United States, and it's estimated to rise in frequency quite dramatically all over the world with over half of the cases uh, estimated to be in China and an increasing number uh, in this country. There are very few treatments available for, for uh, 
mitigating uh, anything but the symptoms. There are no treatments currently available that change the arc of the disease. One of the common elements of the disease is the disappearance of a group of cells in the midbrain uh, that produce the neurotransmitter dopamine. And if you look on this slide on the, on the left, you'll see uh, an example of a section taken through a brain of a patient who, who died for other reasons. And the region of the, of the midbrain that produces this chemical neurotransmitter dopamine happens to coincide with the production of a pigment in these cells called melanin. And so in normal patients, brain sections show uh, a, a, a thin band of these cells. In patients who present with a symptom of Parkinson's disease, uh, already over half of these cells have died. And by the time they succumb to the disease, this stained region is virtually gone. About 100 years ago, a British physician noticed in these cells, in biopsies, the accumulation of aggregates of proteins, and we now know, that, know this to be a very complex inclusion within cells, that may be the uh, basis of the death of these cells. This is a, a structure called a Lewy body, and it uh, can only be diagnosed in people who have died and for whom sections of their brain have been taken. You may recall several years ago, we lost the great comedian Robin Williams. He was eventually diagnosed with Parkinson's, but after he took his own life, his wife uh, had a biopsy commissioned uh, sections of his brain and they discovered these Lewy bodies spread throughout his brain, a very, a very serious and uh, pathologic form of the disease. Well, what can we do about this disease given the, its prevalence and the failure of the pharmaceutical industry to, to, uh, to identify anything of, other than palliative treatment? Two years ago, I was approached by a major philanthropic donor to organize an international consortium of investigators. And we have de defined four areas that I will uh, mention in a moment that deserve a considerable uh, focus at the cellular and molecular level. The effort of the, uh, is called Aligning Science Across Parkinson's Disease, or ASAP. We work in consort with the uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation, one of the major uh, philanthropic organizations that's devoted to this disease. And we hope by focusing on basic science, not just on clinical science, but on basic science, that we'll be able to make progress in understanding where this disease begins and how it progresses. We've identified now over 100 individual laboratories around the world organized into 21 different teams focused on different aspects of this problem. We've invested over $340 million from a major donor and have the prospect of over a billion dollars of investment in the next uh, eight or so years. Let me conclude by telling you briefly what the major effort uh, involves. We focused on the genes that are associated with known forms, familial forms of Parkinson's. There are over 20 such genes, each one of which has a different way of affecting the disease. How these genes fit together, the puzzle that they represent, represents one of the major challenges. There is an aspect of the immune system um, and an inflammatory response in lesions of the brain associated with this disease, but it's not clear what that is and why it may lead to the death of the dopaminergic neuron. So there's a neuroinflammatory effort underway by several of the teams. We don't even really understand how the nerve cells that make this chemical transmitter communicate with one another. So we need to develop an understanding of the circuitry in the brain that allows these cells to survive and to flourish and what may go bad when they die. And finally, we wanna understand the often very mysterious prodromal phase that precedes the development of the disorder, sometimes by as much as five or 10 years. There are common symptoms that are often reported with patients who eventually develop the movement disorder, such as a poorly developed sense of smell. That is not perfectly diagnostic. There are other reasons for this. But one curious phenomenon I'll leave you with is a, a prodromal phase where patients suffer from something called REM sleep disorder, where they fail to distinguish uh, their nightmares from their wakeful thoughts. And they live out their nightmares and they often flail around in bed, harming themselves or their partner. What it is that connects that to the eventual development of Parkinson's remains a mystery. 
These are some of the very important questions that we look forward to addressing as time goes on. So um, let me now um, turn it. Randy? Uh, yes? Randy? Yes. Uh, since you're, you're the, gonna be moderating the rest of the uh, meeting, I, I wanna warm the audience up uh, for asking questions, just asking you a simple question. Sure, go uh, ahead. We're, yeah, we're, we're all familiar with, uh, uh, with cancer being a genetic disease where some of the mutations uh, come about just during the course of our lives yes. from things we eat or breathe uh, and, and some are inherited. Uh, the genes that you mentioned, uh, are those, an, an, uh, how many of them are inherited and how many of them are actually uh, mutations that may occur in these genes that, that happen during the course of one's life? The ones, in can the, the ones that are known, the 20 or so that have been characterized, are all uh, in familial, they're familial forms of the disease. So they come with a family uh, background of, of the disease transmitted to the next generation. There may be uh, other forms of genetic forms of disease that arise uh, in a fetus or later. Um, and uh, only about 30% of the Parkinson's that we know of ha having a genetic basis uh, can be explained. The other 70% cannot. And many of those may be of the sort of later onset genetic forms that you described. Uh, that, is, that remains a mystery. Thanks, Randy. Okay, um, I think probably we'll move along and let me just ask for those of you who have questions of the subsequent speakers or of me, please post them in the chat and we'll address them um, as, they, as they come forward. So in the interest of um, moving the, the, the presentation along, I'd like to now call on my colleague, Andrew Dillon uh, and his uh, postdoctoral fellow, Ashley Frakes to um, give us uh, a presentation on their research effort. Andy, over to you. Thank you, Randy. Um, it's a pleasure to be presenting some of our work to all of you. Um, it would be great to meet you all in person, but under these times, you know, it's this is the next best thing. So I'm representing uh, both myself and uh, my postdoctoral fellow, Ashley Frakes, who will follow me. And we've titled our presentation, Life is Stressful. Um, and that sort of goes, you know, without saying under the past 12 months we've gone through. But I want to reiterate that actually the aging process is actually a stressful process. And we're gonna show you some of the details, uh, molecular details of the aging process and how we're trying to uncover what's actually controlling why we're youthful and why we actually lose those responses um, as we get older. Um, so first I wanna introduce you to Jean Clement. She is the oldest recorded human that we know about. She lived 122 days and 164, 122 years, excuse me, <clears throat> and 164 days. Um, and the reason that I want to introduce you to her is that she is the exception. So she is the oldest recorded human that we know about, and she wasn't holding on to the last stages of her life for a very long time. She was very youthful throughout her entire life. If you look at pictures of her, for example, when she was 70, she looks more like a 40 or 50 year old than a 70 year old. And if you look at, if you start to follow her life, she was living very youthfully. She rode her bike until she was 100 and she actually smoked until she was 117. And it wasn't that her doctor said, you know, you need to stop smoking or else you're gonna die. I mean, she was already 117. Um, it was that she was having trouble lighting her cigarettes. So she didn't wanna keep asking people to do that. The other interesting thing about her is that uh, she had a reverse mortgage at 100. So many of us know about this, older people that own their homes outright can get money out by doing a reverse mortgage. Sadly, she, this guy came along and met her at 100 and said, oh, for three or four years, you know, she'll probably die and I'll get this great house. Well, she actually went to his funeral instead and she, did, she actually won out on the reverse mortgage. So buyer beware when you do this. But these are the exceptions in biology. And this is exactly what we need to uncover what's controlling the aging process is that she has shown us that this can happen. And the question is, how did she actually do it? She didn't have Alzheimer's disease. She didn't have Parkinson's disease. She didn't have cancer. All the things that, would, uh, that all the curves would tell you she should have died of, she didn't have. So how did she actually escape this? So for the last 70 years, research in aging has been focused on taking cells out of humans and growing them in a tissue culture dish or 
looking at yeast cells on a plate and seeing how they age individually. And from this, we've learned a lot of different principles about what controls the aging, the survival of cells individually, you know, in the, in the laboratory, such as the Hayflick limit, which determines how many cells can divide, telomere length, which was determined by Elizabeth Blackburn when she was here at Berkeley and won the Nobel Prize for, and many of these other processes that you see here. And one of them is called proteostasis, which may be new to you, but you will learn a lot about it from Ashley when she describes this. But the question becomes is that do all these, what happens actually when we learn about these processes in individual cells, do they actually hold true when we go back into a whole organism? So you and I are made out of a trillion different cells. Does each cell determine its own aging clock? If it did, then the aging process would be completely sto stochastic. And that's not what we see. Aging is very recognizable. We can see it across the population. We can identify an older person from a younger person. When an older person dies, it's not that their liver is 40 years old and their heart is 90 years old, it is synchronous. So there must be some, some coordination that happens across the entire organism. So what we wanna know is that do these same responses exist? Is there coordination? And if there is coordination, what is actually being coordinated? And which cells are actually the master cell types to determine our rates of aging? So the question comes, those are great ideas, but how would you actually go about studying this? Would you get a cohort of humans right at birth and follow them for 100 years and test out every one of their cells through that 100 years? That would take far too long and we wouldn't be able to test hypotheses. So we turn to model organisms, and this is one which is called the nematode C. elegans, which you're going to hear a lot about. It has lots of similarities to humans, believe it or not. It only has 959 cells, but it has some of the similar cells that we have in you and I. It has skin and muscle and nervous system and a, uh, a digestive system. Um, and it also has a very short lifespan. So within three weeks, we can go through the entire lifespan of this entire animal and do experiments over and over and over again and test many different hypotheses. And finally, all the things that Ashley is gonna tell you about are all completely conserved in you and I. And so with that, I would like to end and um, um, possibly take a question or two, but more importantly, hand it over to Ashley. Um, uh, I have a question for you, Andy. Uh, maybe, maybe you can tell us uh, how that, uh, elderly woman eventually died? That's a really great question, Randy. That's something that we would love to know. So she died in 1996 in, in Arlay, France. And her family would not allow her body or anything to be uh, uh, researched scientifically. They were very much against this. So even to this day, we have no idea how she actually died. But you know, there was an interview with her a week before her death and cognitively, she was perfectly on, you know, with the interview. So it was pretty confident she wasn't suffering from neurodegenerative diseases such as you study. And so we don't know the actual cause of her death. But I do have to qualify this, is that we learned last week of a 117-year-old nun who just survived COVID. So my guess is she's probably going to beat out Jean Comment, and possibly we will be able to study her and figure out why she was able to live so long. Is a great question. I have one other related question. Uh, it's unfortunate that her family was unwilling to let her let anyone take any samples of her. But I, I'm aware of a study that looks at looked uh, at the genomes of super centenarians, people who live to 110 or older. Are there any common genetic uh, loci that that uh, are shared by people who live to such an extent? Yes, there, there is common genetic lows. There are common genetic um, shared across many of these people. The problem is we don't know yet if they are actually the reason why these people live so long. They're correlating, but we haven't taken them out and studied them extensively enough to know if they are actually the reason behind this. And that's a major effort that we're doing and many other labs across the world are doing. Thank you, Andy. Let's uh, turn it over now to Ashley to tell us about your work, Ashley. Yeah, great, thank you so much, Randy. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so as we all know, uh, aging is really influenced by many factors. So most notably, obviously time and also genetics as Andy alluded to um, with his different examples. 
But what I'd like to talk to you today is other features. So we know that how aging affects stem cells, for example, inflammation, um, diet, for example. So what you eat and how you treat your body definitely influences how, you, how you're going to age. But what I'd like to tell you today is um, more mechanistically how we study this in the lab, looking at this really important piece of this puzzle. And that's trying to understand how protein function in our body is affected with age. So just to give you an idea of what, what I'm even talking about. So what is a protein? So if you think of how um, DNA, for example, um, which we all know the genetic material of our bodies is actually the, the instructions to make proteins. So proteins are the actual workhorse and functional molecules in our body that enable us to do every day, attend this meeting, digest food, et cetera. And some uh, key examples that you probably are aware of now and definitely even more aware now are hormones and antibodies, for example. Um, and really, it's very important for our bodies to maintain appropriate levels and the quality of these proteins throughout our life, which is essential for our health and viability. So this is a very delicate balance. And normally we are constantly exposed to stressors throughout our life that challenge our cellular ability to maintain our protein quality. And these can be things such as food source, so eating a fatty meal or um, a high sugary beverage, infection, which we're all thinking about now, but also genetic mutations um, that we're born with and might render us more susceptible or resilient to these challenges. But luckily our cells have evolved um, compartment specific uh, stress responses. So in different parts of the cell that we have protective mechanisms to protect these very important uh, signaling molecules and proteins in our body. How unfortunately work by our lab and others have shown that in, um, this is a conserved feature from worms to humans that these protective cellular stress responses are impaired with age. So you can imagine that this is um, detrimental and a, definitely a bad thing, especially when we think about chronic cellular stresses. So just the, um, the rate of aging and the different, how we're less able to cope with certain challenges. So we all know that it's um, easier to gain weight and harder to lose weight when we're older and our immune systems are less able to deal with infection. Uh, so this is something that we've studied a lot in the lab, and our approach is really to try to understand how this occurs, and then can we harness what we learn uh, mechanistically of what's happening and how these uh, stress responses have evolved to see if we can manipulate them so we can enhance these stress responses to restore this balance and hopefully impact um, health span and lifespan. And if we go back to what Andy was talking about, when we think about how all of our cells in the body fit together, we're really left with the question of, okay, well, are all of these stress responses declining at the same rate in different cells? And do we need to restore it in every cell? And work from our lab has shown that the brain is actually very important for sensing um, these stress responses and communicating it to other tissues. Um, and I'll get to what I'm talking about in a second. Um, but so when I came to the lab, I was very excited um, to study a particular cell type in the brain um, for regulating this important balance. And these are glial cells. So our brains have evolved these very special non-neuronal cells um, to protect the brain. So I came to Andy with the idea that these cells must be playing a role in keeping, um, keeping our uh, proteins healthy and that these probably are playing a very important role um, in longevity. And I should also mention um, that these cells are very important in the context of age onset diseases such as neurodegeneration. So they sense rapid, rapidly changes um, to any perturbations in brain health. And if you look at these cells under a microscope, this is just an example of one of these uh, type of cells, astrocytes. So you don't even know, have to know what you're looking at here to see that there's a difference between normal astrocytes that are just, these are brain sections, um, looking at them under a microscope. Ashley, your slides aren't forwarding. Oh no. What slide are you on? Let's see. Proteins, the workhorses of cells. Oh, sorry, let's see. Let me try again. Thank you for interrupting. There we go. I see it now. Okay. Yeah, well, just... I'll just pick up where I left off. Hopefully you could yeah. follow. Let's see. Yeah. Um,
yeah, so now you can see what I'm talking about, hopefully, um, that these glial cells react uh, very strongly to any changes in um, brain function. And just as uh, Randy previously mentioned, this is a striking feature of Parkinson's disease. So really, we want to understand um, how these glial cells are sensing and responding to perturbations of um, brain function, because really it's an opportunity for us to identify drug targets and biomarkers for disease. So in thinking back to understanding the cellular communication on a more simple model organism in the context of aging, we turn back to the worm. And an experiment I did in the lab was just to ask if we enhance protein um, homeostasis or health just within these um, astrocyte-like glial cells or these glial cells in the brain, does this influence lifespan? Um, so here you're looking at a survival curve of, my, of um, worms over time, and you can see that the normal worm lives about three weeks. However, when we enhance protein homeostasis just within these four glial cells, we can extend lifespan to almost 40%, which is pretty striking. So these are worms that are essentially living 130 years compared to 100 or 140 years. Um, so pretty striking extension and survival. And what we found is that it's not actually just what we're doing to the glial cells themselves, but actually these special brain cells are able to communicate to distal peripheral metabolic tissues um, to regulate longevity. And we did further experiments that if we block this signaling, these animals do not live long. So in summary, we think that restoring protein homeostasis in important cells of the brain, um, other work in our lab is focusing on neurons as well, we can manipulate lifespan and increase longevity. So we think that the brain is playing a very important role to communicate to other tissues and control aging. And future efforts in our lab as we're trying to understand how we can harness um, what we have learned in the worm and translate that to uh, humans and, and how we're gonna think about treating age onset disease. So with that, I'm happy uh, to turn it back over to Randy uh, for any questions. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I, I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, well, it's uh, the longevity. Our longevity is uh, is of, of considerable interest, but but even more importantly is our 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 health longevity, and not just our physical longevity. What 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 can the, the C. elegans teach us about? Uh, a healthy lifespan, not just a long lifespan? Yeah, so that's a great question. So interestingly, even in such a simple system, we can measure health span. So we can measure how well these worms are still moving around the plate. Are they eating food appropriately? Can they respond to pathogens in the same way as young, uh, young worms? So these are experiments we can do in the lab. And in many of our approaches, we see that there is a correlation between increasing longevity and enhancing health span. Um, there are situations and contexts in the field where this doesn't always agree, but at least in terms of boosting protein homeostasis, it, there seems to be a high correlation between that. Well, if we maintain a long, uh, a long health span as well, then one concern raised by one of our um, participants is that if we extend health and life longer, we must reduce fertility and birth rate. There are already too many people on the earth. What happens if, we're, if you're too successful and we end up li all living forever? Yeah, that's great. a great question. So there is a trade-off. So actually, we're seeing this in um, C. elegans itself. So actually, the worms that I just showed you, they lay less eggs um, over time. So it seems that there is a certain allocation of resources, perhaps away from generating more progeny to protecting the other, the tissue of the mother or parent. Okay, th thank you. Thank you, Ashley and Andy. And now let's... Um... Let's turn it, uh, turn it over to David Rollet, our, our colleague in MCB, and his graduate student, Natalie Wolf. David. Great. Uh, can you all, you can all see the screen? Yes. Good. Well, it's, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to speak to this audience and to share our work on next generation cancer immunotherapies. I'll be presenting and framing the question. And then Natalie Wolf, uh, graduate student lab will show you her exciting uh, data on uh, cancer immunotherapy application and in, in experimental models. So, so why is this a, a topic in an aging session? Well, 
I think as everyone knows, cancer is still one of the two greatest threats to the elderly uh, with cancer death rates increasing really quite dramatically after the age of, of 40 and uh, with cancer and heart disease together uh, representing the greatest uh, causes of death for people over the age of 65. I think, I think we all know that. So the question I ask as an immunologist is can the immune system attack cancer cells? And uh, I th I'll start by introducing some of the players in the immune response uh, in case you, you don't know about them. I think everyone knows about antibodies. And of course, there's a lot of talk with respect to the COVID uh, epidemic and vaccinations. And, and antibodies are, are uh, protein molecules that are secreted into our blood and our bodily fluids. And they work by uh, binding to and disabling viruses and bacteria. That's how the, that's the main way that they function. But we also have, as part of our immune system, uh, cells that kill other cells, killer cells. And, and there's two, two main types, killer T cells and natural killer cells. Today, we're going to be talking about mainly natural killer cells, but I'll introduce killer T cells. And both of these kinds of cells function by killing cancer cells or infected cells. Uh, sorry, I had a glitch here. Right, so here's a video showing a natural killer cell coming in and landing on this uh, tumor cell and killing it in a, in a flash of dye intake. And you can see the cancer cell shriveling up. So uh, can we indeed rev up the immune system to cure cancer? And the answer is a uh, definite yes. And uh, this was from the work of, of Jim Allison when he was a, a, a faculty member here at MCB at, at Cal. And uh, Jim uh, came up with a uh, important finding that T cells are often inhibited. They have inhibitory receptors that block their activity and that you could inject antibodies that would block inhibitory receptors and unleash T cells to kill uh, tumor cells. So these were called checkpoint therapies. And these, this led to the development of lots of, uh, of immunotherapeutic drugs that are now uh, commonly used in the clinic uh, Uruguay, Keytruda, Optivo. Uh, some of you will have heard of these and will have seen them in many television commercials nowadays. Now, um, these are really remarkable drugs. Uh, Jimmy Carter's experience uh, illustrates this, and this, of course, is relevant for, for, for the age, age population. Uh, at the age of 91, uh, Carter uh, had a um, metastatic melanoma lesion in his brain that was uh, uh, growing. And uh, he was treated with immunotherapy and, and he's now been tumor free, uh, apparently at least, and he's now 96 and still relatively healthy. So the problem is that many cancers are resistant to checkpoint therapy. And to understand why, I, I'd like to kind of home in on this, uh, how T cells recognize tumor cells shown here. here. So we're blowing it up over here. And uh, th this involves at least two molecules from the tumor cell. That, that have to be seen by the T cell. And so one of them is called MHC, and, and you'll hear Natalie uh, talk about them in the next talk. These are presenting molecules. Think of them that way. Uh, I, I would suggest they're like investigative reporters, if you will. They, they rummage around inside the tumor cell looking for uh, evidence of corruption. In, in the case of tumors, that would be mutant proteins, which arise in cancer at a high frequency. And then they present those uh, peptides from, the, from those mutant proteins on the surface. Those peptides are called antigens. And it's really this complex that needs to be recognized to kill the tumor cells. The problem is that in many tumors, MHC proteins are lost. And uh, in, in many other cases, the tumors don't express antigens or don't have any antigens that the T cells can recognize. Either they didn't have them in the first place, or they had them and then they lost them. And so the consequence is that a lot of uh, cancers are resistant to the uh, currently available immunotherapy. And this just shows a plot of the likelihood that tumors have antigens and then the success of checkpoint therapy. And you can see in this red circle the kinds of cancer that are quite resistant to, you know, really don't respond very well to immunotherapy. These include many of the cancers of the elderly, including breast, prostate, uh, ovarian, some lung cancer, certain lung cancers, et cetera. So uh, what do we do about these tumors with few or no antibody antigens or no MHC, which T cells can't readily recognize? And here uh, we, we think natural killer cells are gonna play a major role. So these are next generation cancer immunotherapy targets. 
And uh, they are useful in this regard because they kill tumor cells, just like T cells do. But importantly, they have a broader capacity than T cells to recognize cancer cells. They recognize many tumors that are invisible to T cells. So we build in the lab on basic science discoveries of how NK cells work to mobilize them to treat cancer. And um, I'll, here's a couple of the findings that have led into the uh, work that Natalie will present. Uh, results from a former postdoc in the lab, Asaf Marcus, on how NK cells are activated in the first place. You basically have to turn them on in order to kill tumor cells. How, how are they turned on naturally during uh, an anti-cancer response? This is what uh, Asaf investigated. And to make a long story short, uh, he determined it was because our cells secrete NK cell activating molecules that are called cyclic dinucleotides. Just remember them as CDN. So these are mo small molecules that our own cells make that are actually very immunostimulatory. But it turns out you can use those then as an immunotherapeutic drug by injecting them into mice or into tumors even to turn on NK cells, NT cells in fact, to kill, to kill cancer. And uh, another finding in the lab concerned the fact that in tumors, NK cells become overstimulated, desensitized, and ineffective. And Michaela Ardolino, a former postdoc in the lab, investigated this and determined that a hormone-like protein called SUPER2 can sustain NK cell killing. Uh, SUPER2 is an is a, a, a improved version of interleukin-2 that was generated by our collaborator, Chris Garcia. And so you can inject then uh, SUPER2 uh, as an as a, uh, approach to make NK cells stay on. And so to mobilize NK cells to kill cancers, you can use one drug to turn on the NK cell killing, that's the CDN. Another drug to make them stay on, that would be SUPER2. And this, as Natalie will show you, is a, is a winning combination. So uh, that's, uh, I'm happy to, to stop here and uh, happy to take question or we can move to Natalie's presentation. Well, I have um, one question from uh, the audience uh, and this could be actually addressed by, by any of us. What is the best way to keep up with advances in research on effects of aging with a view to advancing one's health? Another related question was, to all of us, to each of us, what do we do to uh, take advantage of our own research to live a longer life? <laughs> uh, well, I'll give the first answer to that, and that is, if you smoke, stop. Yes, <laughs> most definitely. The greatest, you know, the rates of cancer deaths have dropped uh, in recent years, and um, you know, some of that is due to immunotherapy, in fact, but, but a lot of it is due to reduced cancer rates, and that's really made a huge impact. Here's another one for you, um, uh, um, David. Do NK cells ever go rogue and damage or kill non-cancer cells? Well, that's an interesting question. In fact, um, you know, that's certainly something that T cells do. It's well known. Um, NK cells seem much less prone to do that. Uh, for various reasons that, that we study, in fact. So in, in a way, they're actually safer for immunotherapy because they have fewer side effects, at least based on, on current findings. Okay, I see more questions coming in, but I think it's time to turn uh, our attention to your graduate student, Natalie. Natalie Wolf, please uh, take the floor. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Natalie Wolf, and I'm a graduate student in David's lab. Um, so continuing off of David's talk, uh, my project focuses on using combination therapies to mobilize NK cells against cancer. So as David mentioned, tumors can evade T cell responses through the downregulation of MHC on cancer cells. So under normal conditions, cancer cells will express a variety of receptors as shown here, um, some of which are these MHC molecules. And T cells are able to recognize cancer cells through these MHC molecules and lead to killing of the cancer cells. However, selective pressures can lead to cancer cells losing MHC and now they become what we term MHC deficient. And in doing so, when T cells come in, they're no longer able to recognize these cancer cells and no killing occurs. But this leaves the option open for other cell types, such as NK cells, to come in and recognize cancer cells. 
and ultimately, oops, ultimately lead to a killing of the cancer cells. And so in order for us to replicate this process, um, we utilize cancer cells that are MHC deficient, such as these, and therefore are targeted for killing by NK cells. Um, in order to drive inactive NK cells to kill off tumors, we use a drug called or CDNs to superactivate NK cells. And this leads to NK cells infiltrating into tumors and killing off tumor cells. And uh, CDNs are currently being investigated in the clinic to elicit T cell responses. But we know that many tumors evade C C T cell responses. And so we wanted to know are CDNs viable as a therapy for these MHC deficient tumors? And so first looking at a model of leukemia, um, in these experiments, mice have fully established tumors that I start treatment on day zero um, or not, and then monitor survival of the animals in which um, they stay free of tumors indefinitely. So as you can see here, mice that receive no treatment shown here in the black will survive only about 10 to 20 days. Um, whereas mice that are treated with this uh, drug cyclic dinucleotide shown here in blue, we see 100% of these mice survive free of tumors indefinitely. Examining a model of colorectal cancer that more closely resembles human cancer, again, we see that treatment with CDNs shown here in blue does prolong survival in these animals compared to the no treatment alone. Um, but we see that very few, only about 20% of these mice remain tumor-free indefinitely and go on to survive. And so while we see in some of our models a great outcome with CDN treatment, our models that are more similar to human cancer result in few to no cures when treated with CDNs alone. And so this tells us that there is room for improvement upon CDN therapy. And so we know that CDN treatment, we can activate the NK cells and drive them into tumors. But what we also know is that these NK cells can become tired or desensitized. And this leads to them becoming non-functional and not able to kill off tumor cells. And so from previous work that David discussed, NK cells can be reactivated um, when treated with this drug Super 2, allowing them to continue killing off tumor cells keeps them in this active state. And so we wanted to know then if we treat tumors with a combination of CDNs and super two, are we able to cure more mice by sustaining the NK cells in the tumor? And is this a winning combination? And so in the colorectal cancer that we use that is more similar to human cancer, when mice are treated with either CDNs alone shown in blue or super two alone shown in green, we see again that there's this extension in the um, uh, survival, um, but ultimately a few of these mice, uh, only about 20% remain free of tumors indefinitely. And now when we treat mice with a combination of CDN and super two shown here in red, 100% of these mice survive and remain completely free of tumors. And this is very exciting to see as it shows how effective this combination is at enhancing anti-tumor responses. And we also see that this therapy works as well in other tumor models that we have that are similar to human cancers. And so in order to confirm NK cells are responsible for mediating tumor rejection in mice treated with this combination therapy, we can deplete cells from mice and monitor survival. So again, with no depletions, with just the CDN super two combination, we see that again, all of these mice survive and remain tumor free. Now, when we deplete mice of NK cells, and that is we get rid of all of the NK cells within a mouse, we see now that none of these mice will survive past 40 days. What this indicates to us is that NK cells are playing an important role in mediating tumor rejection. And if we look at mice that are depleted of T cells, again, we can get rid of all of the T cells within the mouse. We see that all of these mice survive and remain tumor free, indicating to us that T cells are not mediating tumor rejection and that this therapy does indeed mobilize NK cells for anti-tumor responses. And so overall, when, we, when mice are treated with a combination of CDNs and super two, we see based on other work that I'm not able to show today, 
that we get an increase of the number of NK cells that enter into tumors. We see that there's an increase in the ability of the NK cells to kill tumor cells. We see there's an overall decrease in tumor growth and a large increase in the cures observed in our hard to treat models, suggesting that this combination therapy does enhance anti-tumor responses through the mobilization of NK cells and is a winning combination. And with that, uh, David and I will take any questions. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, Natalie and, and David. Uh, there are now a number of questions that have come in, so I'm gonna have to be fairly selective. Um, and there's, there are a few that, are, uh, that either of you can answer. Uh, one is, do NK cells ever go rogue and damage or kill non-cancer cells? Yeah, that, that one came up before. Uh, they, they don't really. They're very, uh, they're very unlikely to, to cause autoimmunity based on all the uh, current uh, research that we know of at this time. In that sense, they're safer than, than T, cell, uh, T cells are in the context of immunotherapy. And perhaps a related question is, how does an NK cell recognize a tumor cell? You want to take that one on, Natalie? Yeah, so NK cells use um, a variety of receptors that they express to bind to different um, surface molecules or ligands, as we call them, on cancer cells. Uh, and through that recognition, are able to then kill off um, tumor cells. Yeah, it actually is a little connected to the earlier talks by uh, Andy and Ashley in the sense that the uh, expression of those those proteins on the surface of cells that NK cells target are actually regulated by stress processes in cells. So, so for example, uh, protein unfolding will, will cause expression of some of these molecules. Damage to our cell's DNA will cause expression of some of these uh, proteins, et cetera. There's several different types of stress pathways in cells that turn them on. And those stress pathways are often activated in cancer cells, which explains the the link to cancer. Well, given the uh, exciting results that you shared with us, Ashley, of course, the natural question from many in the audience is, uh, uh, are there uh, clinical trials underway with combined CDN super two treatments? And, and if so, where can one sign up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so there are not currently trials with this. This is all preclinical work that we are doing. Um, but maybe someday it will advance to that point, uh, which would be... Cyc cyclic uh, dinucleotides yeah. are in clinical trials now, but uh, the combination, and, and also H9MSA, or uh, I'm sorry, the super two and other molecules like it are also being tested in the clinic, but no one has done the combination therapy. So we're trying to, uh, you know, to push that forward towards clinical trials. That, that's our, one of our uh, aims. Here's a, a rather more specific question. Uh, how specific are the signatures of the mutant protein peptides presented by the MHCs? Uh, are they common across differing tumor types or unique to differing tumor types? There are both uh, common ones and uh, unique ones. Um, there depending on the cancer type and people are trying to make various uh, therapies that will be specific for certain cancers. Um, we also know that, you know, cancer cells are self, so you have to try and avoid anything that will lead to therapies that will end up attacking your, your normal cells. Um, but there are cancer specific uh, peptides that are found. Here's another one that either of you can answer, and that, and that is in your experimental animals, um, uh, have you seen any effect on, on um, uh, neuronal tumors, brain tumors, or is that not something that you've been looking at? Yeah, we have actually been doing some uh, collaborative studies with, uh, with the laboratory at UCSF uh, looking at uh, glioblastomas. That data looks actually very nice. Um, so we think there's, there's promise with that approach. Is there a limit in the size of tumor that can be treated with NK cells? Do they only go after big ones or can they be used to treat, um, for instance, uh, bloodborne uh, uh, cancers? 
Mm. Well, everything that we focus on, uh, we basically grow tumors to a certain size and treat. Um, we have not looked at very large tumors. Um, usually those are harder to treat as they're more resistant. Um, but we are hopeful that uh, these therapies will work on larger tumors or uh, potentially blood tumors. Um, and it's something that we plan to try further down the line. One of the, one of the most deadly cancers, one that has resisted uh, the now uh, immune approach that was pioneered by Allison, is pancreatic cancer. Have you uh, looked at that model in, in uh, your experimental animals? We, we have not, but uh, I think it would be an interesting uh, one to investigate, but we have not yet looked at pancreatic cancer models. I agree, it's a very hard one to treat. It's completely resistant to, uh, to checkpoint therapy. What about side effects? And have you, have you observed any side effects in, in, in your experimental models? Yeah, so this is something I've looked at um, because we know uh, super two is a uh, variant of the natural forming IL-2, which is known to have side effects in clinic. Um, so I've looked at the combination therapy and I don't see major side effects. Um, specifically pulmonary edema um, is something that people get. And so we have uh, not observed this in the animals that we treat. Okay, well, there are many questions that we won't be able to address. There are, were a couple that came up after my presentation, and so I'm gonna um, raise those and, and try to answer them. One was, do you think there could be a problem with the blood-brain barrier and a gut connection uh, uh, in Parkinson's disease? And certainly uh, the, uh, the gut connection is uh, experimentally amenable. There, there is some evidence for the, an influence of the microbiome, the, the, the group of uh, intestinal bacteria, and, and they, that they may change uh, in Parkinson's disease. Indeed, indeed there is uh, evidence now for um, the, the, remember I showed a picture of Lewy bodies. There's evidence that this could begin in the gut. There's a bacterial protein that looks a little bit like the basic protein in Lewy bodies called alpha-synuclein. And there's evidence that alpha-synuclein, if it's introduced into the gut can progress uh, through the vagus nerve uh, into the brain. And so uh, that's an, a, a very active area of investigation. Um, and uh, finally, a question came up, are Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia related? Um, this uh, person uh, has, uh, her husband has Lewy body disease, but none of the physical symptoms of Parkinson's. Really is a mystery, the connection between the two. My wife, uh, had diffuse Lewy body disease, but she had Parkinson's disease uh, very clearly for 15 years before her Lewy body dementia uh, developed. Uh, there are some people who have exclusively Lewy body dementia. Um, what the molecular and cellular connection between those two is, is not known. Indeed, Parkinson's may be more of a spectrum disorder than an individual disease. That really is one of the problems in trying to find a therapy. Okay, um, I think now is the time to turn, uh, turn the mic back over to my colleague, Mike Botchen. Mike. Well, thank you, Randy. And thank you, Andy, Ashley, David, and Natalie for sharing a glimpse into some of the frontiers of aging research. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, the, clinical the clinical trials of the combination therapy. Uh, and many of us, if we... Uh, if we're unfortunate enough to get cancer, would like to sign up. That was one of the comments made. And uh, of course, Andy uh, and, and, and Ashley, uh, if uh, we're all looking forward to how, how, the, how uh, keeping the glial cells happy in the, in the brain uh, signal to other tissues to stay young, uh, if this turns out to be something that, that human beings uh, can take advantage of as well. Well, sign me up there too. Uh, anyway, I, I love a good science talk and it's important to me that our community and beyond can experience the same thrill that I feel when researchers describe their own work or tell a good story. Uh, and it, it shows you all the excellence of, of uh, basic research at UC Berkeley. 
our, our excellence goes deep. It's not an accident that you're hearing from gr a graduate student and a postdoctoral research. Students and postdocs are, of course, the future leaders. So I want to point out how important teaching and education is to research and vice versa. Your support and adv advocacy uh, of Cal means everything to all of us, to the incredible faculty and the fantastic students that we have. So I want to say a special thanks to our alumni and friends for gathering here tonight. Tonight's event is intended to shine a light on the science of aging, but our series of science talks more broadly help us to convey the importance, again, of basic science and how that leads to fantastic translation uh, and cures. Uh, while it's essential to apply our science to solve problems, it goes hand in hand with the foundational work as I just said, to these solutions. Basic science has always been one of Berkeley's greatest strengths and it remains a strength and it will persist as so. If there's anything you wanna learn more about or you'd like to support our work for which there is a deep need, please be in touch with us. We absolutely want you to be part of advancing basic science education and the science of aging and neurodegenerative disease and cancer. Uh, uh, at, at, at Berkeley. Uh, we hope to see you at our next event, which is February 25th. 5th. Uh, with that, fiat lux, and of course, go bears. <laughs>